Hey friends, we're off here again for the Louisville Pro Activist Report. Uh, I'm really excited today. I have a very special guest with me. Uh, such a special guest, in fact, that you all know. Usually in my t-shirts, I actually have a collar today. I had to, had to get a little fancy for this one, so hope you all appreciate that. Um, but uh, election time's coming up again, as it always seems to so soon. So uh, we got some big races coming up. We all know Senate races mayor races, but we also have a very important race for Congress. And, uh, you know, that, that seat's currently held by John Yar Yarmuth, but he is being primaried this time around uh, by my guest today, uh, who is Attica Scott. Uh, Attica ser currently serves in the Kentucky House Representatives for District 41. Uh, you may also know her uh, from the Louisville Metro Council. She used to be on, that was uh, District, or, uh, District 1, I believe. Uh, and you're currently running uh, against Yarmuth for District three correct um so let me switch this camera for you all and get attic on here there we go welcome to the show attica thank you so much for being here thanks for having me on the show i appreciate it all right um so as you all know i am a policy guy but uh, we are going to let you all get to know attica a little bit here before we get into the policy uh, so if you would just start off, you know, by telling us a little bit about your background, your ties to the city, to the state, and, uh, you know, why, you know, just what's important to you about Kentucky and Louisville? Well, I was born and raised in Louisville for the most part. Uh, there was just a little bit of time where I lived somewhere else because my parents moved, but Louisville's where I was born, went to uh, elementary school here, middle school here, high school, but then I wanted to go away to college and I wanted to go to a black college. So I moved to Appalachia in East Tennessee and attended Knoxville College, which is a historically black college. And then after getting married and having two kids, I came back home to take care of some elderly relatives and to work as coordinator of Kentucky Jobs with Justice. So for almost a decade, I walked the picket lines with organized labor, helped to organize the unorganized, focus on immigrant worker justice, single payer health care, restoration of voting rights. When you talk about justice, we worked on those issues. And so I've been home now for a couple of decades and began getting directly involved in politics uh, a little bit more than 10 years ago because we, some girlfriends and I realized that people at the local, state and federal level here in Louisville weren't reflecting our values and our vision of what could be. So we decided that instead of continuing to com complain about it, we were gonna run for office and we were gonna do something about it. And so here I find myself doing something about it and running for office. That's awesome. Uh, I love to see stuff like that. Uh, so again, I'm here with Attica Scott. Make sure you all sharing this out. Uh, if you have any questions for Attica, drop them in the comments section. We'll get to those as we as we can. Um, so sticking with your background a little bit, uh, you first got in office with Louisville Metro. Uh, I see that you filed something like 80 bills or something like that, Louisville Metro. So uh, we don't have time for all 80, but you know, uh, just give us kind of some of your highlights of, of your work with the Metro Council. Definitely. So I've filed more than 80 bills as a state rep. But on Louisville Metro Council, I focused in on issues around worker justice, employment issues, environmental justice issues. I was vice chair and then chair of the Vacant and Abandoned Properties Committee because where I live in the West End of Louisville, that was a huge issue. My neighborhood, a third of the properties are abandoned and vacant. So I wanted to make sure I put all of my energy into that issue. But while on Louisville Metro Council, I was able to uh, lead the effort to get a minimum wage increase for Louisville. $7.25 is poverty wages, and it has been for a decade now. And so we were able to get the minimum wage increased. It was a battle. The mayor didn't support it. And so it was a battle with him. And then unfortunately, about a year later, the Kentucky Supreme Court shot down our minimum wage increase shortly after they asked for an increase for themselves from the state. Um, and they said that this was an issue for the state. Then I also led the effort for a ban the box legislation to take that question off of job applications that ask whether or not you have a felony conviction because people deserve second, third, fourth, fifth chances, however many they need to be able to thrive. And so that was unanimously passed. And then I also led the effort to get a unanimous uh, resolution passed to support restoration of voting rights. So that was the kind of work that I did uh, on Louisville Metro Council. Okay, yeah, and I, I love that band the box. That's important legislation too. So I appreciate that. Uh, so, so moving on to you know the your current position in the house. Um, 
T tell us a little bit about your work in the house and, and some of the stuff that you've done. So the house is where I have filed more than 80 bills and I've already filed uh, more than half a dozen bills that uh, will hopefully be heard in the 2022 session. So I've pre-filed a, a lot of bills so far. And so my focus has been on maternal and infant health. Um, my focus has definitely been around police accountability and, and issues around education because that's a passion area of mine. So I listen to students. Students bring ideas to me because they feel like Representative Scott is a state rep that we can actually talk to and go to. She'll listen to us and she'll work on our issues. So I pre-filed a bill around teaching the history of racism in our public schools. This is the third year I have filed a bill at the request of students to expand the history um, education around African-American and indigenous uh, history. I have filed a bill for student journalists to be able to be protected and to report out on things like a president coming to visit in Lexington. So those are the kinds of issues that I have helped to champion at the state level. All right. And what I can say from personal experience is um, we see a lot of these politicians, uh, you never see them. You literally never see these people. Uh, but you all know I'm out all over the place and I see you all over the place. Uh, so you actually don't just talk it, you walk it, you get out, you support various issues. I mean, I, I can't even remember all the stuff I've seen you at. But, but the big thing that I saw you at a lot was obviously the Breonna Taylor movement. Um, you know, you were out in that. Um, what did that mean to you, you know, uh, being involved with that movement? That was important because our community was in pain and crying out for justice. And people needed to see an elected official who was going to be on the front lines with everything that came with being on the front lines, whether it was my daughter and I getting tear gassed or the two of us getting arrested, whatever the case may be, people needed to know that somebody who they elected and put in office was going to show up and be there with them. And that's exactly what I did. And then I turned that protest into policy to help lead an effort on no-knock warrants. And although that effort ended up getting snatched away from us and stolen by someone in the Senate and a very watered down version of what we the people wanted ended up passing, it was important because it gave power and energy to people in Lexington to say, you know what, since Frankfurt failed us and isn't going to keep people safe, Lexington, Kentucky is going to pass its own no knock warrants bill. And that's exactly what it did this summer. So the work that we did in Louisville, I want people to know it was encouragement for folks all across Kentucky. Yes, and that, that, even watered down as it was, it has been effective. I, I was, saw some stats the other day in the reductions of the amount of no knock warrants. I think they said there were like six or seven and and a couple of them were health checks, stuff like that. So it's really decreased those. Um, so, it, I mean, obviously it could have been better, but even as it is, you know, you got the ball rolling and it has made a difference that we actually see in the community. And, and that's great to hear. Well, the one thing I do want to say is that's Louisville's bill. Yeah. Louisville's bill was passed last year and it has already shown those results. We haven't seen any data yet from the state level. So we don't actually know whether or not the bill has made a, a difference at the state level and what that difference is. Uh, uh, sorry for saying that. That's that okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so so that brings us to today. And uh, so you, you're running for Congress, District 3 here in Kentucky against John Yarmouth. Um, so why this office now? Because we have the right to run for office at every single level when it's the time for us to run and when the people are encouraging us to run. Young people have been tired of being told that the Green New Deal is not feasible. People that I stood on the front lines with last year were tired of not having a member of Congress who was fighting to hold police accountable fighting to end qualified immunity for officers and tired of not having someone who was going to go and do their best to protect protesters. So it was time for someone like me to run for office and to say, you know what, we deserve to have someone representing us from Kentucky who's going to actually fight for us because they've been through what we've been through. Hmm. Okay. Um, so what were your thoughts on Yarmouth? Do you have any, uh, like the job that he's done? He's did an okay to a job for sure. And what I want to say to people is this is not a run against him. This is a run for Congress. And that's very different. I'm running for Congress because so many people have felt left out, left behind, powerless and voiceless. And I want them to know that I'm taking their power and voice with me to D.C. All right. So uh, I do have one kind of tough question for you here. Um, 
this is something just that I know is I, I used before I got into local politics, I, I was on the national level trying to be an activist. Uh, I ended up switching because I felt like I wasn't getting anywhere with that. I didn't feel represented by literally anybody uh, in Congress at this point. Um, so my question is, uh, you know, I've supported some people in the past. There are, there are some some candidates out there that kind of ran as people's candidates. Uh, but once they got in, they didn't quite pan out the way that we thought they were going to and uh, been kind of disappointing. Now, I'm not going to say any names, but, um, you know, it is what it is. But what I think is there's a lot of pressure from the Democratic Party uh, to have people kind of fall in line. And I think that's the biggest hurdle for a candidate such as yourself or maybe even somebody uh, also like a Charles Booker that, you know, once if and once you get elected, you know, you're going to have these pressures that they're going to try to get you on their itinerary versus your itinerary. So how do you think you uh, can fight that off and do what you can to do? I've had to do that at every single level. Serving on Louisville Metro Council, we had a Democratic mayor who's still the mayor to this day. I certainly didn't fall in line with his agenda. Uh, even now, as a state representative, we have a Democratic governor. I certainly didn't fall in line with his agenda when he sent the National Guard to the west end of Louisville, where I live, and David McAtee was murdered. I certainly did work to hold him accountable. And I won't fall in line in D.C. because I serve the people. I don't serve other politicians or a political party. That's awesome to hear. And I, I believe that too. This is one of the reasons why I'm here interviewing you today, because I, I think that you do have what it takes to stand up to them. Uh, it will be a lot of pressure, but uh, I think I think you can do what it takes. So um, let's get right into your platform. I was looking at your platform. It's a really good platform. Um, basically, what it, it seems to me what you're running on is, is justice. You have mm -hmm. seven forms of justice on your website. So let's break those down here one at a time. Uh, so people can kind of hear what you're about. Um, but, you know, we talked about Breonna Taylor already. So let, let's get into the racial justice. Um, let's start with, you know, no-knock warrants, uh, the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. You want to talk about those things? Yes. So the uh, George Floyd Justice and Policing Act is a national piece of legislation that will hopefully see the light of day and end up passing. We're not sure if it's going to happen or not because the Senate is always uh, obstructionist with uh, Mitch McConnell there uh, and Rand Paul as well. But it's important that we have legislation at the federal level that does exactly what I was talking about is one reason why I'm running because we need to make sure we're protecting people from violent policing. And that's exactly what that act is designed to do. And that's why I'm supportive of it. Okay, uh, any other thoughts on racial justice or any plans once you get in office? Racial justice is, is something that exists in every aspect of our community. Institutional and systemic racism is real. So whether it's education, whether it's banking and industry, whether it's real estate, whether it's community development, racial justice is going to show up in all of those areas. And so that's why when you look at the, the body of legislation that I propose, it touches almost all of those different areas because we have to look at it comprehensively. Okay. Um, so next up, let's talk about health justice, um, and that, that's a pretty broad topic there. Uh, I know that can go a lot, of, a lot of ways. We'll get into some specifics here in a moment, but just give me your overall thoughts on health justice and, and what you have planned once you get in office. Well, we definitely have to address the issue of maternal health. And across the country, including right here in Louisville, Kentucky, black women are three to four times more likely to die in childbirth than white women. And we're doing nothing about it as far as policy is concerned. And that's why I have proposed that legislation at the state level for two years in a row. And that's why I will support the Momnibus Act in D.C., which is also addressing some of those issues around maternal health. And I was going to ask you about that. That's the uh, Black Maternal Health Momnibus? Y yes. Uh, so tell us a little bit about that bill. Yes, yeah, so that's the, the federal level bill, which is addressing issues like um, maternal health, access to doula support services, um, access to breastfeeding support, making sure that someone who is pregnant has support during the pregnancy and beyond the pregnancy. Because what has historically been the reality is that people think that pregnancy and the implications that occur during and after giving birth only last just a couple of months after giving birth. For a year, someone who gave birth can still feel the impacts of that delivery. And so we have to make sure we expand that period of support for someone who's given birth. So the Momnibus Act at the federal level would help to do that. 
And it's a very good uh, piece of legislation. I looked at that the other day. Um, it's I'm a really support that. well. It's a really good piece of legislation. And the sad reality is, we don't have enough women in D.C. to be able to push that piece of legislation. Because what happens is, men men who are politicians see that as a women's issue. Oh, it's their issue. We don't have to make it a priority. That's why it hasn't been a priority yet. Uh, well, to me, women's issues are everybody's issues. So, that's right. You know, uh, without women, none of us are here. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's all I'll say about that. Um, another big bill, uh, maybe the biggest bill in, in, in health care right now is the Medicare for All bill. Um, now, you were at the Medicare for All March, so I, yes. I saw you there. So uh, that tells me that you support it. Yes. Uh, so why do you support that bill and uh, what do you like about it? Well, it's important that everybody has access to health care and quality health care. No matter where you are, who you are, you deserve access to health care. Where I live in the West End of Louisville, people shouldn't have to wonder whether or not they're going to be able to go see a doctor or a dentist because they can't afford it and then wait until the emergency room becomes their health care provider to go seek help. They need to know, oh, it's there for me. I have it. I have access to it. I don't have to wait until I'm literally on my deathbed to go get help. And I've seen far too many people, including people in my family, who don't go seek medical services because they can't afford it. That is unconscionable. And I'm not going to sit back and say, oh, we can't afford Medicare for all. I can't afford to see my family die because they can't go see a doctor. Yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of sad to say we're the only first world country that doesn't guarantee health care to every citizen. Um, there's a lot of challenges to getting that bill through. What, what do you think it's going to take to get that bill passed? It's going to have to take political will. That's the bottom line. We're talking about politicians who are just fine themselves. They're okay themselves. Their needs are met. They're not thinking about the people whose needs are not met. So it's going to take political will. It's going to take changing the people who are in office. That's part of the problem. You can't keep the people in office who aren't championing our issues. Why do we keep doing that to ourselves? Get them out of there. Get people in who are going to fight for us. Awesome. I, and I, I can definitely go off on a tangent of Medicare for all, but I'm not going to do that today. Uh, people know how, where I stand on that. So um, yeah, is there anything else you want to add as far as health justice? Anything else people need to know? Well, health care is a human right. And so every single one of us deserves access to health care and we got to fight for it. And the sad reality is we do have to fight for it. We shouldn't have to because that takes a toll on us as well in our health. But we have to. All right. Um, so environmental justice, uh, that's another big one too. Uh, yes. There's another really big bill uh, going on with that too. Uh, so give me your thoughts on environmental justice and uh, what you think about it. Definitely. So I live in the West End of Louisville. That's where I was born and raised. There are 19 chemical companies along the Southwest End all the way to the West End of Louisville. When my uncle died 11 years ago, he had four forms of cancer. I remember waking up, going to school, and there would be a layer of soot on his car from those toxic emissions. Wow. So I've lived the reality myself of environmental injustice and environmental racism. And so I support environmental justice because I want people in Knox County, Kentucky and Martin County, Kentucky to have clean bathing and drinking water. They shouldn't have to struggle, right? With clean bathing and drinking water because utility companies have polluted their water streams. We aren't holding fossil fuel companies accountable who have lied to us for decades about the reality of their toxic emissions. They must be held accountable, but we're not doing that right now. And we definitely need the Green New Deal. And that's why I filed a resolution in Frankfurt this year to support the federal Green New Deal, because that's a job generator. It's a job generator for people who can move into this new industry that's focusing on environmental issues, that's focusing on reclaiming land, cleaning up brown fields. This is where we need to go. This is the direction we need to move in. It's unacceptable to have our current member of Congress from the 3rd Congressional District say that the Green New Deal is not feasible. You know what's not feasible is people dying because of extreme heat or dying because of flooding or dying because we are having these weather events that are destroying our environment or because we are allowing the fossil fuel industry to run our government. And I think that's important because uh, I can say to the viewers, you know, if you think this doesn't impact you, it does. I can speak to this personally. Uh, we recently moved to Shelby Park uh, only to find that we had extremely high levels of lead in our water. And the city had to come out and actually replace a pipe. It wasn't our pipe. It was a city pipe. 
Yeah. Uh, and they will do that for you all if you let them know, but they're not going to do that unless you let them know. But don't think that we don't have environmental issues such as lead in the water. Uh, we also had really high uh, levels of uh, lead contaminants in our soil. So yeah. the garden that we started to grow, we couldn't even eat out of. Uh, so this is a local issue. This isn't just on the coast. This is, isn't up north or, or down south. It, it's right here in the city uh, and sometimes right in front of your eyes. So environmental justice is very important to each and every one of us, regardless of where you live, the east end to the south end to the west end. It affects you. It does affect us because remember the, the wildfires in California? We were being impacted by that right here in Louisville. Smoke travels. It doesn't just stay in California and say, well, there's the border. I can't go across that California border. No, it literally was traveling all the way to Kentucky and impacting Louisville and our air quality. That's the reality that we face right now, folks. Yeah. It is, and uh, that's a big one. You know, um, there's so many things right in front of us, and, and the environmental one just seems like it seems broad to people, but it's really personal at the end of the day, and it is affecting everything that you do. Uh, you know, friends, family, neighbors, coworkers. It's affecting us. So, so yeah. Uh, I'm glad to hear you so passionate about that, and, and thank you for supporting the Green New Deal. Mm -hmm, definitely. Um, but we have more to talk about, mm -hmm. and, and again, uh, I'm here with Attica Scott. Uh, any questions, just drop them in the comments, and uh, we'll get to those. Uh, so next up, uh, I know you're big on employment justice. Uh, there's a lot of things there that I'd like to talk about with you. Um, I'm personally a union member. Uh, I know you're pro-union, um, so speak you know, to my union brothers and sisters uh, about uh, why unions are important and, and uh, you know, what you want to do for unions. Definitely. So for almost a decade, I was coordinator of Kentucky Jobs with Justice. So I was on those front lines with organized labor. I was on the picket line with organized labor. And why unions are important is because collective bargaining gives you a voice at work. Collective bargaining allows you to make sure you're paid fair wages with benefits and you have a safe working environment. That's the power of a union. And that's why I've stood with labor and fought so hard to support labor. And we have to continue doing that because everyone deserves to have a voice at work. It's hard to do that by yourself. And if you are someone who thinks you can do it by yourself and, and get um, what you need at work in order to thrive, I encourage you to think twice and to consider joining your union or helping to create one. Um, and it's one of the reasons why my very first legislative session in Frankfurt, I voted against right to work legislation. I voted against legislation to end prevailing wages and not pay people the going weight rate for uh, contractor uh, work because it was it was inappropriate and unacceptable. Uh, and it shows too that uh, right to work states have a lower average salary than not, than union states. So uh, it is a big deal. And and when union raise it, wages come up, everybody's wages are raised mm -hmm. by that. So, so even if you're not in a union, uh, it should be important to you if you like to see higher wages. Another thing with employment justice is, you know, uh, child care. You mm -hmm. got to be able to work. You got to have somebody look after your children while you're at work. Otherwise, it's kind of hard to do. Um, so I know you're a supporter of universal pre-K. Can you yes. talk about that a little bit? Yes, definitely. So I'm a mom of two kids. And so when my kids were younger, I was working full time. I still work full time, but I also was working part time. And so I know how expensive child care is. It's ridiculous. It took about a third of my paycheck and then rent took another third of the paycheck. And there wasn't very much left for us to survive on and I was still paying student loans. Um, so yes, I support universal uh, pre-K because it's important for people to have the support that they need in order for them to be able to work because I know people need to work. They have to work, but also it's good for our kids. It's great for our kids to be in that kind of early educational environment where they are supported and loved and in a, a productive situation while their parents are at work. And of course, they get to be kids right. at the same time. Um, so also with employment justice, uh, let's talk about living wages. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you're talking about seven twenty-five an hour. Um, where do you think living wages, sh you know, our minimum wage should be at? And, and uh, you know, what, what can we do to raise those wages? The floor is $15. That's the bottom, y'all. That is the bottom. That's what folks are fighting for right now. I know a lot of unions have been um, working on the issue of fight for 15, as well as a lot of uh, other folks across the country. That's where we start. That's where we start, but that's not where we end. And we have to be very clear about that. It's not the end. And we don't need to wait a decade to raise the wage again. It should be adjusted for inflation. 
And that's part of the mistake that we allow ourselves to make when we think that um, just getting something that's the bare minimum is enough. No, you have to adjust it to the rate of inflation so it will go up consistently year after year. That's it. And, and the Republicans in Congress try, just try to do a trick where they raise the minimum wage and tied it to inflation, but they raised it at a very low wage so that every time it, it bumps up with inflation, it's still not a livable wage. Mm -hmm. But then they can say, well, we raised the wage. We don't need to deal with it anymore. So we have to be careful with the tricks as well. Um, well, if we didn't have to deal with it anymore, then people wouldn't have needed the COVID relief um, that they've gotten over the past year. Well, some people, you know, in Kentucky still haven't gotten um, their unemployment insurance benefits. But we needed to provide those COVID reliefs because we were paying so many people poverty wages. They didn't have savings. They didn't have something to fall back on because they couldn't save. How are you going to save on 725? How are you going to save on a poverty wage? That's it. And and, uh, you know, with, with employment justice, I want to ask you where you stand on UBI, universal basic income. I'm actually working on a piece of legislation right now on universal basic income with uh, Russell, a place of promise, which is in the Russell neighborhood. I represent part of the neighborhood. And about a month or so ago, folks um, who are on staff came to me and asked me to work on that legislation with them. So we've been working on that for about a month now. Um, and still working with it with our Legislative Research Commission in Frankfurt to make sure that it is a robust piece of legislation um, and that we're very clear on how it's going to be paid for and uh, making sure that we capture the people who will really benefit from it. So that's what we're working on right now. Nice. Uh, so any other thoughts on employment justice? There are so many issues because it's all connected, right? right. It's connected to housing. It's connected to health care, employment, health care, housing. It's all connected. Yes. Uh, so before we move on, we've got a, a question slash comment here. It's kind of a big one, so I'll read it out to you. This is from Melanie. Thanks for sending this in. Uh, she wants to know, how can we bring environmental justice to Louisville's rubber town? It seems that many of these factories get away with fines because the city says the state should enforce fines and the state says the federal level should handle and then nothing ever happens. Should we make these companies move or force them to shut down the PFAs? man-made forever chemicals are three times the level in our drinking water. So we definitely have to have more responsibility at the federal level. I really feel like the federal government has failed us on environmental issues, on holding these corporations accountable. But we've also allowed local government, in particular the executive branch led by the mayor, to give these companies a, a pass, to give them a break. We have the STAR program, Strategic Toxic Air Reduction Program, that I spoke in behalf of years ago. It was probably 14 years ago at this point. Um, to make sure that we're doing our part to hold these companies accountable. But we have to enforce regulations and we have to have higher fines. Y'all, if you give a company a slap on the wrist with a fine that, you know, somebody can pay out of their pocket, that is not a deterrent. That is not a deterrent. It has to be much higher than what we have right now. Um, whether or not we force companies to move is a community conversation that we have to have, which we, in all honesty, have not had robustly. I live in the West End of Louisville. I don't know anybody who's been talking to folks in the West End of Louisville about getting these companies to move. So that's a conversation that has to be a community conversation because we do have people in our neighborhoods who work at those companies who are going to want to be part of that discussion to say, just like we're talking about making sure the people who used to work for the coal industry have other jobs. We got to do the same thing for black folks in the West End of Louisville to make sure they have other jobs as well. We can't abandon them either. So let's let's have the conversation and let's make sure it's robust and that we're not leaving people out of it. And that's where that Green New Deal can come right in that's there, too. Right. And, and like you say, it all ties together. That's right. Uh, thank you for your question, Melanie. Mm -hmm. uh, again, anybody have any questions, just drop them here in the comments and, and we'll address those as they pop up. Um, so the ne next form of justice that you're about is something that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, again, as my viewers know, uh, and that's marijuana justice. Mm -hmm. um, so just talk about that. Uh, you know, wh what are your thoughts on that? We need to legalize weed. For the people who need it for health benefits and we also need to make sure we legalize weed because we have arrested too many of the people that i know and live with and who are friends and family members um, because we saw it as an easy way to incarcerate more black and brown bodies we need to decriminalize marijuana louisville has done taken some steps towards decriminalizing marijuana decriminalizing marijuana but it can't only be louisville right it has to be the entire commonwealth of kentucky and it has to be something that we look at across the country and so I support legislation to legalize and decriminalize marijuana. Awesome. And, uh, I'm going to put on my activist hat for just a moment uh, to say any, any bill that we want to see federally, we, we need to know uh, that it, it's not going to create like a Marlboro situation, that it is actually for the people 
and uh, it also should be expunging records for, for people mm -hmm. for possession because that really uh, hurts people in their careers and ability to take care of their families. Um, so I'll leave it at that before I get on my high horse on, on, on that issue. Um, but another very important issue, uh, and I know uh, a lot of, and again, I'm here with Attica Scott. Uh, please share this out. Um, drop your questions below. Uh, but we're going to get into student loan justice. And, uh, you know, we're close to a bubble with, with student loan mm -hmm. debt in this country. So uh, talk about the effects of, you know, all these student loans on, on society and, you know, how, how we should handle that. Listen, for over 20 years, I had student loans that I was trying to pay off. And I'm going to try not to get on my soapbox either, y'all. But I just paid off my student loans last month. Last month. Single mm -hmm. mother of two kids working a full-time job part-time job, still couldn't pay off those student loans. They were ridiculous. And so I don't want anyone else to have that story um, to share and that experience to share. We need to cancel student loan debt. We need to make college free because we can do that if we have the political will, but we don't have the political will. We need to hold these student loan companies accountable. My loan was through Navient. And, then, and look at them now. Look at them now. So y'all, I support canceling student loan debt. I have no qualms about it. I paid off mine, and I don't want anybody else to have to go through what I had to go through, trying to make ends meet. Uh -huh. Even though it took a while, congratulations on getting that paid Thank off. You. I know it, that's like a celebration there. Mine, it, it was. Too. Yeah. It was. Yeah. If it wasn't COVID, I probably would have had a party. And a lot of people don't even understand that. I mean, it, it's keeping people from buying houses. It's keeping people from buying better cars. A lot of people have really old cars that you know are always in the shop. Uh, which is another bill, you know, when you don't have a lot of money in your car, you're having to get it fixed. Uh, it's keeping people from from starting families even. And uh, a lot of people are staying with their parents uh, much longer than they anticipated in life. So it, it's a big deal. Uh, it's like an anchor mm -hmm. on, the an on the ankle of a lot of people. So, so yeah. Um, the next one up, uh, you know... Uh, I mean, you're hitting all the all the all the things that I talk about here. It's it's great to see. Uh, I'm a big uh, election integrity guy. Uh, mm -hmm. I'd like to not be, but I don't see any of these other issues getting fixed without you know proper elections, proper voting procedures, and stuff. So so you talk about ballot ju uh, justice. Um, so give us your thoughts on that, and uh, you know what direction we should go with that. Election integrity is important, and I just want to say to folks who are viewing. We do not have a wealth of election fraud, y'all. We do, or a voter fraud. Let me be very clear about it and very specific about it. You will hear people claim that there is a lot of voter fraud. There is not. I serve on the elections committee in Frankfurt, and I will tell you now that um, those stories are designed to scare people uh, in, in order to scare them so that they can then take away our right to vote in lots of different ways. And so for me, ballot justice includes access to the ballot. We need to have same day voter registration. We need to have mail-in ballots as a form of voting all the time and not only when there's a global pandemic. Um, I, we need to have restoration of voting rights, automatic restoration of voting rights. We have an executive order, but that's not enough because that can be overturned by the next governor. We need to change the Constitution of Kentucky to allow for people to vote. You should be able to vote for prison. People who are incarcerated should be able to vote. There's a lot of work that we need to do around ballot justice right here in Kentucky, but we also have to make sure that at the federal level, we are making it possible for that to exist without it being a state by state by state decision. Because if we leave it up to the states, then what we're gonna have is a state by state by state decision where Georgia steals elections uh, from someone like Stacey Abrams or where Kentucky isn't automatically restoring the right to vote or not allowing mail in voting as a, a common practice or allowing same day voter registration or allowing people who are incarcerated to vote. Or you know what? We should be able to uh, absent, you know, vote uh, absentee ballot without an excuse. And you're spot on pointing out some of the differences too. I know you talk about ballot justice, a lot of people start thinking things like, uh, you know, uh, dead people voting and stuff like that, but that's not really the problem. The problem is more on the election side and not the voting side, stuff like, uh, you know, uh, voting machines with proprietary software, gerrymandering, these kinds of issues uh, that really hinder the process. And, uh, you know, it's not actually people at the ballot with their vote. And that's a distinction that I, I think some people don't see. Uh, so I'm glad that you pointed that out right away. That, and, 
you know, that's important. Um, and it's also important for people to know that when you talk about gerrymandering, we're about to come upon redistricting for Kentucky. Folks, please pay attention to what's going to happen with redistricting in Frankfurt when the session begins in January. You want to see some gerrymandering in action? Pay attention to the legislative session and see what those legislators try to do to take away the right to vote or take away who represents you. That's it. And that's one, uh, you know, uh, we, we look at here locally, uh, Charles Booker's old district where they lump in West End and downtown with Indian Hills, which, you know, obviously makes no sense. They're not neighbors, uh, but it is designed to suppress votes by doing things like that. Well, but people may not know that the district I represent, 41, goes all the way out to Westport Road. It goes from nearly Chickasaw Park to Westport Road, Melwood yeah. Avenue to Oak Street. Are there like gaps in it too? It's a salamander shaped district. So it kind of goes in and goes back out, in and out. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So I know what gerrymandering looks like in action. I, I'm living it right now as a, as a representative. And it's amazing how they always want to include the West End with those gerrymandering too. So yes. that really does suppress the black vote here in the city. Uh, I do have another question pop up here. I haven't read it yet. Uh, it's from Melanie. Uh, thanks again, Melanie. Um, do you believe the cannabis use should be allowed in public? What are the issues of allowing or allowing it to be used in public? How close are we to HB 461 passing? Thanks for the question about um, using cannabis in public. I hadn't thought about it um, as far as uh, public use because I know that we regulate cigarette use in public. And I imagine we're going to have a lot of pushback from people who say, well, you know, if we're not going to allow people to smoke cigarettes in public, why are we going to allow them to smoke a joint in public? So it's something that I would need to be part of uh, more conversations around, to be honest with you. And as far as uh, seeing legislation pass in the next session, we were actually able to get a bill passed out of committee. So I, I do want to lift that up. And I do believe that we can get a bill passed off of the House floor, but it's going to take people who live in uh, communities that are, are rural across Kentucky to put pressure, to apply pressure on their state representative and their state senator. So if anybody watching those folks who live in rural parts of Kentucky, get on them. Get on them. Our folks in Lexington and Louisville are with us. Get on the folks who live in areas with rural representatives. And I don't know if we mentioned it earlier, but uh, you are a co-sponsor of HB 461 uh, with Nima Kulkarni. Yes. Uh, I think uh, there's a third person on that. Is it, is it Lisa? Is it Lisa Rep I think it's Rep Wilner. Yes. Yeah, yes. Okay. Yeah, um, I thought so. And, but I do want to say to folks that um, for years, I would be the last person to sign on to um, marijuana legislation because it did not include decriminalization. So I had people who would come at me um, and, and be all upset because I didn't sign on. And I said, I tell you what, you go back to the West End of Louisville. You tell black folks that uh, their state representative signed on to a bill that didn't decriminalize marijuana. I wasn't going to do it. So people can get upset all that they want to, but they're the very same people who don't spend time in the West End of Louisville where I live. So if it doesn't include decriminalization, I'm going to tell you all now, I'll be the last person to sign on. Uh, and I'm totally on board with you on that. I was just having a conversation with somebody about this, uh, I think it was yesterday. Um, if the legislation isn't done right, then we need to be against it until we get the right piece of legislation. Mm -hmm. And uh, so just saying something is legalized and then you go read the fine print and it's not what it appears to be, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it doesn't decriminalize. Maybe it, they had a bill that was turned down in Ohio, thankfully, where basically uh, created a monopoly for a giant company to become the Marlboro of marijuana there and it didn't help people grow or anything so uh, but they pushed that as a legalization bill but yeah if it's not right we don't want it we'll wait for the next one and uh, I'm glad that we're on the same page with that mm -hmm. um, so that is your justice platform uh, yes. as I'm calling it or you may be calling it that as well but uh, you know I want to ask you about my personal uh, project and that's net neutrality mm. uh, i'm big on that um, for those that don't know what net neutrality is that that gives everybody the ability to go to any website uh, equals any other website so no favoritism basically on the internet and even playing field for all basically um, we had that take it we always had net neutrality uh, obama put it into law uh, and then trump appointed a GPI to the FCC and, and this guy was a Verizon lobbyist whose job was to come in and gut that law and he did that. Uh, Biden has not touched it. So uh, where do you think you stand on net neutrality and uh, you, you know what can we do about that to make it a permanent situation? 
I'm definitely supportive because I know what it's like for these uh, corporations to have monopolies or have a stronger uh, voice because they have more money. And that is not something that I think any of us should stand for because we want to make sure that all of our voices get a chance to be heard, right? All of our stories get a chance to be told and for people to be able to see our stories and share our stories. So for me as a member of Congress, I know that it would be part of my job to apply pressure to the president of the United States, but also to my colleagues to make sure that we're passing legislation so that we can you know, make sure that we codify net neutrality. Because if we make it something that a president is responsible for and only the president, it can change with the next person. That's just it, and it just flip flops back and forth. Or we just don't ever get it back, one or the other. Mm-hmm. Um, so we talked about a lot of stuff here. So my, my final question on your platform is just, uh, with all that, all of that, everything we talk about is so important. Uh, and so many other things, so important. Uh, but day one, you get an office, what's your number one priority? My number one priority is to definitely make sure that I connect with members of the Progressive Caucus because I will want to be a part of that, cro- that caucus. I think it's time for real progressives to be part of that caucus, to push for change. We saw what they were able to do this week under uh, the leadership of Representative Jaya Paul to make sure um, that we are speaking for the people of Louisville of Kentucky and of our entire country. So I want to add more voices to that group um, because I know that none of us can do anything by ourselves. That's not at all possible. But before we go, one thing that I make sure that I say everywhere that I go is that y'all, we have a ballot initiative in 2022 to take away the right for an abortion for people in Kentucky. Folks, it's going to be on your ballot in 2022. Pay attention to that, folks, because we are going the way of Texas. We think it's only Texas, but it's already here in Kentucky, y'all. So pay attention to that. What's on your ballot in 2022? The names that you're going to vote for, but also the issues that are going to be on the ballot. That's what it all comes down to, legislation and issues. So let me let me follow up on that. Uh, so once you're elected, you get in. What one of the one of the issues I've seen over the years is is with abortion. It's been used by the party to kind of fundraise, but they really haven't. They kind of just sat on their laurels with, with Roe v. Wade. Uh, they probably needed to go further and do some legislation out there and make this a permanent thing. So, what do you think we can do? Uh, you know, are, are there any options? What you know, where do we go uh, to protect the right to have an abortion? How do we do that and not have to worry about it again in the future? It can definitely be legislation. We can definitely codify the right to abortion um, and we can do that through the House, but we also have to make sure that the Senate is right there with us. So y'all, we need new members in the House and the Senate to make sure that we protect the right to an abortion. An abortion is health care. It's no one's business why someone is having an abortion. It is health care. That's it. All right, I don't have any more questions here on my screen or for myself personally. Um, so I'm going to give you the floor and I'll let you just speak to the viewers, let them, you know, sell them on why they should vote for you. And then when you're done with that, let them know how uh, they can find you online. Oh, hold on, just had another question come in. Let, we'll hold off on that for just a second here. Uh, so th- this is also from Melanie. Uh, she's got all the good questions today. Uh, what can we do to make sure civics courses are also part of JCPS school curriculum? Many people don't know what and who their state reps are, and many people don't think they can call other reps that they can only contact their own. That's a a very good question, and I know that there are some fabulous school board members who um, can respond to that much better uh, than I can, but I am a member of the House Standing Committee on Education because I'm passionate about public education. It's one of the reasons why I am filing legislation, and this is the third year I have filed it, to expand the teaching of um, black history and indigenous history to address the history of racism um, as an issue that's addressed in our public schools. And yes, we do need to have a more robust system of teaching how um, government actually works. I'm just a bill and I'm sitting here on Capitol Hill, was okay for me when I was growing up, but we need more than that, right? Um, And that's a fun way to bring people in, but we also then need to have conversations around how do you engage with your elected official? That's first and foremost, because there's still, Melanie, a lot of folks who don't know who, who their elected official is. 
I definitely don't judge people on that because we haven't done a good job of making sure that they know how um, to know who their elected official is. And so I try to do that education, but it needs to not only be part of the curriculum in JCPS, but it needs to be part of ongoing civic education for young adults and older adults as well that we all um, participate in making happen. Whatever your organization is, make sure that that's something they're doing on a regular basis. Um, because there's so much that, you know, I will acknowledge that I learned in school that I may not remember um, to this day because I learned it for a test. I didn't learn it to retain it for ongoing knowledge and information. So I want to be honest about that as well. So I support ideas uh, and I'm more than happy to be involved in any kind of ongoing civic education. All right. Uh, so uh, once again, I'll let you do your pitch. And then when you finish up, let people know how to find you online, how to donate, how to volunteer, all that good stuff. Awesome. Well, I'm Attica Scott and I'm running for Congress in Kentucky's third congressional district because I have a fire under me to fight for our environment, to fight for good paying jobs, for our health care, to make sure that I'm centering the stories and voices and experiences of young people, of women, of people of color, because for far too long we have been ignored and left behind. And that time is over. We are not standing for it anymore. We are running for office at every single level. In case folks were not aware, there is not one single woman who represents Kentucky in Congress, not one. It's time for us to send the woman back to DC to fight for us here in Kentucky. If you are uh, someone who wants to get involved with our campaign, the Attica Scott for Congress campaign, you can find us on our website, Attica for Congress, A-T-T-I-C-A-F-O-R congress.com. You can also email me at info at Attica for Congress.com. And you can follow me on um, many of the social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, at Attica for KY. That's A-T-T-I-C-A-F-O-R-K-Y. If you want to volunteer with phone banks or volunteer um, at events, then definitely uh, sign up on our website. It's one of the first things that pops up when you visit the site. And you can also donate on our website. Awesome. And I, I do have the link to your website in the description. Awesome. Uh, so just click that link and, and check at it, Attica out, um, you know, and if you feel passionately about what you see there or what you've seen here, you know, donate, volunteer, or, uh, you know, if you can't do those things, just spread the word, you know, share this out uh, for sure. So, uh, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Um, just a reminder for Melanie, who's totally on it. Thank you so much today, Melanie. She says, Women's March tomorrow at 11. Uh, right. Just so you all know, I will be there live streaming that for sure. Uh, will you be there tomorrow? I will. And I did find out that the 11 o'clock event is being merged with the 10 o'clock event. So there's going to be one event at 10 o'clock tomorrow on the steps of Louisville Metro Hall. Awesome. I, I will definitely see you there. Okay. Uh, so again, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your contributions, Melanie. Uh, we greatly appreciate it. Uh, thanks to everybody watching. Uh, everybody shared this out. Uh, we appreciate you all so much. Let me get this camera flipped again. All right. There we go. Um, so yeah, this is, uh, as you all know, I'm totally independent. Uh, nonprofit. I make no money off of this. Uh, so the way that you all can help me is just by sharing, clicking all those appropriate buttons because you know I'm on Facebook, I'm on Twitter, I'm on YouTube, I'm on Odyssey now. So like, subscribe, click the bell, you know all the buttons. Share this out. Comments help my algorithms as well. I'm independent. Uh, I don't get the same algorithms that that uh, some of these big outlets get. So you know I just count on you all to help me with that. Um, so again, uh, Melanie, Melanie says thank you, Rep. Attica Scott. I support you. So yes. Um, so yeah, and, and again, you know, it, it is hard to get information on on some races sometimes. Uh, so that's why I do these videos for you all. If you know anybody that's unsure about who to vote for, they don't know. You know, they kind of like Yarmouth, but they're not sure. They like Attica. You know, show them this video. Uh, let them get to know Attica and uh, make an informed decision on that ballot box. All right. Um, so again, I will be live tomorrow somewhere around 11 o'clock at the Women's March. I will see you all then. Uh, thanks again, and remember to always, always think critically.